Well, hello, and welcome to the show. I'm Nadia Giordana, and you're watching It's a Woman's World. Our guest today, Judith F. Brenner, is, among many other things, a recent author. Her book, Moments Between Dreams, uh, besides being an exciting novel, encompasses some subjects that uh, we also want to talk about today. And those are domestic abuse and also polio, which has been experiencing or enjoying a resurgence in our society in recent years something that uh, not everyone knows about. So let's go meet Judy and commence the conversation. Hello, hello, and welcome to the show. I'm Nadia Giordana, and let me introduce first off my co-hosts. First up is Barbara Lavalure. Hi, thank you, Nadia. I'm really excited uh, to be speaking with Judith this, uh, today and um, look forward to our conversation. You're an author yourself and uh, a co uh, TV host of your own show. So I'm always happy when you come on. Thank you. Candy Pettiford, hi. Oh, I'm so glad you said my name right. Cause so, so many people say Pettiford and I say, I've never seen a furred truck or a furred <laughs> car. So thank you for saying Candy Pettiford. And as being an, an author, I am excited to hear all about what Judith has done. I've got questions for you, Judith. So get ready. Okay. You are an author and a performer. So that's yes. a lot of talent building up here on the program. Susan Strauss, Dr. Susan Strauss, said, welcome to the show today. Thank you. It's so nice to be back. It's been a while and uh, I've, I've missed it. And I'm anxious to hear what Judith has to say about her novel. I, I think what sounds so interesting is that she's bringing in the historical issue of polio and then tying that in as well to domestic violence. I mean, it's a interesting juxtaposition. So I'm anxious to hear what you have to say, Judith. We all are. And I'm not finished with the book yet, but I, I did get started with it. And uh, it's, it's, it's a gripper. When you start reading, mm. really, you're instantly involved with the characters. And of course, the subject matter just jumps out at you. I had no idea that uh, 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 polio was coming back, as they say, but let's not have me talking. Judith, why don't you tell us what the catalyst was for this book and, and how this all came together? Sure, sure. So uh, to start out, it is inspired by a true story, but it is completely fiction. And I've woven in uh, real life ex events with um, fictitious scenes that are even mixed from current uh, year and transferred to the 40s and how that would have happened. And the inspiration was uh, my mother, Rosemary Wangelnik, um, contracted polio when she was four years old in Chicago and told me of her surgeries. And really when I was in high school said, Judy, Judith at the time, like she called me Judy if. <laughs> uh -huh. it up. Don't everyone do that. Um, <laughs> that um, she wanted people to know about her surgeries because as possibly we all have parents who said, you don't have it as bad as I had it. Well, my mom had it bad. I mean, she, we couldn't put on the kitchen light above our um, our table at twilight until it was really pitch dark because it reminded her of an operating table. So in a way she had some PTSD that wouldn't have been diagnosed that way of, of just having the fear of another surgery. She had seven surgeries. 
And so I allude in the book, The Moments Between Dreams, to a few of the surgeries that this fictitious patient, Ellie, the daughter of the protagonist, Carol, has gone through and how her mother empowers her, alleviates her fears, and um, in her recovery stages, empowers her to walk again with very difficult walking aids. Putting a brace on your leg then is very different than now, not to take away anyone's troubles of, of walking with the brace today, but the steel bars, the weight of it, the, you know, there's just so much more technology today to help a person walk with polio or whatever malady they might have. So that was the inspiration. I went and asked my grandmother when she was living, how is it before to raise a child? And this is before I was even a mother. I was, I was in college at the time. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll try an essay or two on this while I was studying at Columbia College in Chicago. And my gran grandmother said, oh, Judy, you would not want to live the life I lived. And I said, well, why? And she's like, I was put on such a strict budget by your grandfather, and I had very little money to make the meals, and I had to ask permission for anything. He'd never let me wear makeup. And I said, yes, but what about like raising my mom? And she just went on and on about the strife, but never alluded to any beatings, but did al allude to a difficult life. And so then I went on to college and went other careers in journalism. And I, I tabled this novel because I didn't even think it of a novel at the time. I just knew I eventually wanted to tell my mom's story in some form. And it was, was this uh, last five years that I started the project. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you talk about polio, and I know Nadia mentioned that it is coming back. I want to try to clarify that. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it the polio that's coming back, what I have heard called uh, post-polio syndrome, where it's people that have already had polio and no. they're getting it. So this is something different then. People are actually getting polio. Correct. And in, in fact, today on Twitter, Bill Gates was is in Pakistan talking about an end polio campaign. So if you search the hashtag end polio, you'll see in Pakistan and other um, countries where it is making a resurgence. I think there were eight cases this month. Um, there's a, a still the oral vaccine being administered. And in some cultures, either there's an access problem where there's a war problem or there's a fear problem of vaccines. So for those reasons, it's coming back. It's not coming back in the United States We've not seen any cases. I'm not an expert, but that's my reading knowledge. Um, post polio syndrome, um, in the back of my book, I write about uh, some resources um, from the American Disabilities Act to um, the Rotary International, which um, campaigns for the end polio campaign and is still collecting funds for that front. Um, but the post polio health international network, I was very excited to have a board member from PPHI uh, endorsed this book. And it's it's because the polio story hasn't been told to this generation. Um, but post polio syndrome, basically, my mom had it. She got it when she was starting at age 30 and progressed to age 72 terribly wow. to where she almost was paraplegic or a good shoulder all of a sudden couldn't raise higher than this. The good leg that was not braced would not have any muscle control. So muscles were atrophied because of overuse. And they that's why they, it's not the virus anymore. Post, the virus is gone from the body, but the syndrome remains. And many of the survivors today are in scooters, unable to walk. Um, and that's where the Post Polio Health International is a, um, a worldwide organization. And I was thrilled to have them read the book and have Sunny Roller endorse it because it it's not talking about post polio syndrome, but it it's just talking about it's not it's not gone. It it still exists and we need to be aware. Judith, uh, uh, your book has so many threads. Uh, I'm I'm quite um I'm quite fascinated by you know not only the polio um part, but uh, and it takes place in the 40s, which is when when I was born. Um, but it also uh, talks about um, isolation due, due to the recent COVID pandemic. 
and uh, it touches, well, touches it heavily on domestic abuse and mm -hmm. also family relationships. Mm -hmm. So when, when you have uh, someone that you want to read the book, what is it that you want them to be left with after reading it? I have a reader discussion guide on my website, mm -hmm. judithfbrenner.com. And I worked closely with my edit my editors at the publishing house to develop questions that we thought readers would be left with and one was um i really wanted to write a, a a book that's historical fiction that would make someone think think mm -hmm. big about could um the gender roles be reversed could a woman be an aggressor and um hurt her lover or husband um how relevant and and um prevalent is um violence against women today it, it, it's truly a huge factor and i want people to ask their neighbor in their congregation is that a bruise did you have don't want to embarrass you did you have plastic surgery or is that are you okay at home it's okay to have those uncomfortable questions asked and i hope readers would think about being aware that not everybody is okay behind closed doors the person who goes to church and is the very robust woman or man and has this beautiful personality behind closed doors, doors can be in a uh, heckle and jive, um, you know what I mean, Dr. Heckle and, and uh -huh. high, um, personality. And um, I've had bosses who were very controlling and pounding of fists and the aggression um, is still out there. So I want readers to think about um, red flags. I would love young people to read this book, teenagers to read this book, um, to be aware if their boyfriend is having a temper tantrum because they're talking to another boy at high school or in college or isn't always where they say. I want people to be aware of these Apple tags where you can put them in your on your car key so you know where your keys are. But what if that boyfriend or girlfriend is putting it secretly in the person's backpack? and stalking them. This is happening today. So I want people to think about um, vaccines, viruses, fear, movie centers closed back in the 40s. School was on the radio. Today, school was on the internet. All these things tie in. So I just hope book clubs would consider uh, thinking about these issues and talking about whatever they're comfortable with talking about. Thank you. Wow. Well, would you ever consider this, Judith, to be a uh, uh, it sounds like it could be a movie to me. Ooh. It really does. So I'm putting it out there. Um, <laughs> I think that this could be a movie. And then you kind of mentioned in the back, you said you had something where people could find out about polio and whatever. Do you have any places where women could find out how to get help for domestic yes. abuse? Yes, yes. Yes, they, that the, is so the, needed. Yes, the, in fact, the, I'm fortunate that the publisher um, has my book distributed in the United States and the UK, um, Australia, et cetera. So I went ahead and put together a resources book page Great. where you can see, um, excuse me, yeah. the phone numbers. And then for audiobook, it is available on audiobook on my website under resources where that reader discussion guide is, is this exact same list of hotlines in the United States, in the UK, in Canada, and in Australia, as well as, um, locally because this book takes place in Chicago and I'm a Minnesota resident and a Chicago native. I included the local Illinois and uh, Minnesota hotlines for any person who's feeling very unsafe at home, how to get some shelter if they can't um, gain help from their family members or friends. And even if they can, they might need a quick escape. Well, quickly, have you ever gone through any domestic controlling man at all? Have you gone through anything like that? Personally, no. I think my mother, um, having been raised by a, a father who was very aggressive, she brought that personality into our home, um, but we stopped the cycle. And um, okay. so I did a lot of research with um, a very valued journalist um, who is a New York Times writer, J um, Rachel Lewis Snyder, wrote a book called No Visible Bruises. And I don't mind touting about that book because it was part of my research to read her documentary of what happened in the United States. She interviewed both men who were aggressors and women who were victims and vice versa. 
uh, gender on gender um, violence. And she's interviewed the caseworkers, and it's a it's a great resource. So that those are some situations where I pulled in along with sadly news accounts of um, you know even today there there was a. a Two weeks ago, a, a woman's body was found in California that they couldn't find where the the boyfriend, you know, yep. ended her life. And and it just, it just, so those are the experiences where I, I've seen, but luckily I've seen the red flags. I did have a boyfriend who had a temper and I was uh. like, I can't be with you. He was throwing a bicycle out of a van that we were on a bike trip and because he's angry about something and I, and in college he was I had many friends in male and female and could, he couldn't handle that was kicking curbs and I'm like this yep. isn't like healthy that's a warning I, I, sign I had to get away from that well Judith Thank you. I'm thinking about uh, red flags and the red flags uh, of your protagonist in the book and also real life red flags. I've certainly seen a few. I've been fortunate not ever having been trapped in a situation like that. I feel so grateful. I've seen a little uh, uh, angry body language. And, you know, even that's disturbing enough if it, go, if it happens too frequently. But uh, I feel fortunate. But I've seen in other people's lives and uh, uh, people that I've known, especially a very dear friend. Uh, can you give us an idea about these red flags, what to watch for and what women should do? Well, again, I'm not an expert. I'm a journalist by training, but I will tell you that in my research, um, the red flags come in all um, colors, if you will. Um, there is emotional abuse. I had a, a high school friend who was um, on the heavy side, but her husband would pick on her and pick on her and pick on her and bully her to narrow her self-esteem down so that he had more domineering personality in the family and made her feel small. That is a red flag to me because that's emotional abuse. There is financial abuse. So should you get into a relationship and the person will not combine the checking accounts or makes you combine the checking accounts so that one person only has control. One person's name is only on the car lease or on the home lease. With the better credit, there are situations where that might make sense, but it could be a red flag if it's mutually, you're both capable of being on a uh, title. That to me is a red flag because I think there's so many um, females I know that get trapped because they don't have the financial. So that's financial abuse. That happens in my book. There is um, other types of abuse beyond physical. And any, time of, any type of um, wanting to know where you are, looking at your phone messages, those um, control factors, especially with social media, checking in on you, knowing your passwords, wanting to know your passwords, wanting to know when you're, where you are and where you're going. Those tracking, it's, it's one thing to care about a person and say, I would like to know in case you don't come home where you've been. That's valid. But to know every single detail is very disturbing. And I would, I would caution people to just be aware of when it's overboard. Thank you. You know, Judith, you, you bring up the, the C word, the control word. Um, and uh, within the last month, I had a family member tell me that she has left her husband because of that very thing. I, I, um, I don't know whether there's been uh, abuse of any kind, but definitely a, con a control issue such that it was not healthy for her. So um, uh, th that said, I think that there, it's very difficult for a lot of women who have this experience of controlling, but they still love their spouse so mm -hmm. much. It's very hard to break away because of the conflicting emotions. Um, yes, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the isolation uh, that people have gone through in the last couple of years, especially mm -hmm. bringing that to 1940, to the time of your book. Um, how did you uh, incorporate that? 
Sure. So I did in my research, I recognized that one um, method of control is to cut out the family members so that you can't bring your guests to the cabin. You can't bring your guests to your son's birthday party. It would only be the other spouse or other boyfriends or girlfriends uh, choices. So those um, I, I did have some friends who I lost touch with personally, and I didn't understand why aren't they um, calling my calling me back or why aren't I invited to the child's birthday party? And it was the spouse who was controlling. So that isolation starts early in the relationship where it's like, I am your center of attention. You only need me. I love you. The passion, the, what you spoke of is that person loves that person. They feel the care. The um, projection of jealousy is somewhat flattering and good looks, you know, great intimacy. You never know, like, what are the attractions, but the power struggle is dominant. So these are the isolating factors that even translate to when we sadly had the pandemic with COVID-19 in 2020 that carried over to 21. And so many people, even companies were saying, don't come to work. So you have um, humans living in the home with their abuser, their emotional abuser or physical abuser, mm -hmm. and they are isolated completely. They can't even go out and get a coffee anymore and food being delivered. So imagine the trauma. I did um, read news reports that calls to those crisis lines went up and yet the crisis lines were staffed, but there was no help. There was no one to come into the office and offer that shelter. So it was very traumatic. I think it would, would have been worse almost in 2020 than 1940. I don't know that, but um, in the forties with the polio epidemic, movie theaters were closed schools were closed, school was on the radio. These are situations where isolation is very precarious. You know, I'd like to add one other type and it, it maybe is inferred with physical violence and that is um, sexual abuse within yeah. the uh, partnership Brand, for with Amber, whose husband is touching her sexually a lot. He'll grab her breast or he'll grab her in her crotch and she'll say stop don't do that and his response is well you know i'd only do that to you because you're the only woman i love yeah. and there's not a, a rape but it's almost like a a sexual assault that goes on mm -hmm. frequently within a week and she said i almost started to question myself and think, well, yeah, he, he's right. I don't think he would do that to anybody else. I know he's just doing that to me because he loves me. It's about so, respect. Well, it mm -hmm. is. And, and it still had that control issue in there. Her husband is a big man. He's got a big voice. Um, he's, he's a nice guy. We all like him. But he's mm. got this piece that he does to her and she questions then her own perception of it. Am I overreacting? Mm -hmm. there, there's a term out there, domestic violence is a term, but there's a new, newer term in the last, I think five years called intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. And that would fall in that category. And I, I, I'm again, not an expert, but my understanding is that intimate partner violence it is a synonym to domestic violence, but it truly could more specifically come to mean in the marriage bed, in the marriage household, that your intimate partner who you have sexual relations is being inappropriate and disrespectful to your body. And that's where that can be reported or counseled. Um, and I, I hope that she, you know, calls them on it because again, teaching those children, what is acceptable as a, a respect for women is what my character Carol is doing with her son, Tom saying, I know, you know, this is wrong. Do not hit women. And I know mom, I know mom is this reply, but she's got to teach her son that that is not a role model. Uh -huh. And I, I, I hope other people will see those red flags and say, even if I feel safe at home, this is an inappropriate role model for my children and we need to make a change or make it, make a move. I've heard you talk about 
uh, a couple of different um, abuses, like um, uh, financial, you said, uh, domestic and verbal. Um, out, of, out of the ones that you're thinking, verbal and, um, and domestic uh, violence. Mm -hmm. Ver verbal is all, also just as bad. I mean, because, oh, you're nothing but a, just a, oh, mm -hmm. an old hag around the house. You're just a, you know, I mean, so, but when do you, and let's say you have children, when do you say it's time, not to kids, let's be shh, quiet, but let's get out. When do you, when do you say, let's, let's go, let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, everyone's got to make that call on their own when it feels safe. Um, there, I mean, verbal abuse is emotional abuse. And yes, children are children are subjected to emotional abuse in an abusive household, and it's very disturbing. And there's there's hotlines for that, but there's um, there's there's unfortunately a, a lot of trauma that we need to just be aware of. And I think there needs to be more work in America, at least, about how do you um, teach those aggressors to manage their behavior so that they can feel self-esteem without having to put people down and i think that's what it comes from is in if i self-analyze my character joe he's got a self-esteem problem and he needs to prop himself up by having that control over his wife and his his children except he he um, favors his son in this story mm -hmm. so he's got that sexism going on where the male is in the, in the traditional role in his head of what a role should be in the 40s and 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 in the 40s women um went to work in the factories because men were called to war in, in World War II. So then women were displaced when the men came home in, in after the war and in the 50s pushed back into the home as the homemaker where many women were learned to drive while their husbands were gone, learned to run a, a machine lathe and punch drill press, et cetera, beyond typists. And so that I, I got off the topic, but I just wanted to show how women yes. have been cornered, um, particularly into these roles and sexism roles beyond the violence that I also, as a feminist, believe, I hope this book opens that conversation. I think that this book would be really great for mm -hmm. high school, uh, not only girls, boys too, because mm -hmm. I need to educate our boys. I think it really would be good for exactly mm -hmm. what you say. And we've run out of time here today. Oh, no. wow. I'm disappointed we could have gone on longer. Uh, I want to say that yeah. the, the, um, the book has a character, Sam, who is a role model. So there's a good role model that young men and, and mature men. And Judith, I just thank you so much. Judith, and thank you. Barbara, Candy, Susan, and our wonderful audience. We'll see you next time on It's a Woman's World. Thank you. Thank you.